He moved to the New York Stock Exchange in 1982 as Senior Vice President for Communications and went through several different chairs uh, in the Senior Vice Presidencies there uh, until in May 1987 he became Senior Vice President for Corporate Relations of the Stock Exchange. In that position, Mr. Moore is responsible for the exchange's strategic planning, corporate marketing, government relations, and communication functions. He is also responsible for economic research, marketing research, and the corporate secretary's office at the New York Stock Exchange. Now, I realize that what happens on the New York Stock Exchange is probably of academic and abstract interest only to members of the City Club, but I hope you will give him your polite attention anyway. Please welcome Peter Moore. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, this is a special day for me. Uh, I grew up in Portland, and it's always a pleasure to come back. It's especially special also to be able to share the day with my mother and father here and other friends and family as well. For those of you, by the way, that want to know what happened thus far today in the market, for those of you looking at majority and minority reports, I'm here to report that as of 3.15 New York time, 1.15 Portland time, the market was up 10 points. So hopefully we're on the way back. I think it's also fitting that I should uh, address you one week after Senator Mark Hatfield, because after graduating from the University of Oregon in June of 1966, the first job I had was to work for the advertising agency that ran the Senator's first campaign for his first six-year term. And since 1982, when I came to the exchange, Senator Hatfield has addressed our board of directors on numerous occasions and participated in several of our major issues conferences. So today is not just a homecoming for me, it's also a renewed uh, relationship with the state of Oregon that I've enjoyed for a long time, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. As the title of my talk really indicates, I want to try to do two things in the minute, few minutes we have together. One is to go back and share with you in a highlight version what happened last October 19th and 20th. But more importantly, what I want to do is deal with the implications coming out of last October because there are a number of them and they're being debated right now in the halls of Congress, in business boardrooms all around the country. And it's very important that we feel that we are coming out around the country not only to share our thoughts with you, but just as importantly to hear back from you. So I want to leave plenty of time at the end of my remarks to handle whatever questions you have, because we really do want to know what's on your mind, what things are concerning you, and what you see for the future in our equity markets. I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. The first will deal with the issue of capacity. One, how did we get through that avalanche of volume last October? Two, what are we able to do today if we get a similar type of a volume? And finally, what will we have to be prepared to handle in the future? The second part of my talk will deal with the issue of market volatility, which according to most of the people that we chat with, this is the one issue that concerns them the most. How do we find a way to constrain what happened yesterday? I'll talk about the collar, I'll talk about what did and didn't happen yesterday, and I'll also spend a little time talking about this issue called program trading, because it's on everybody's mind right now. And finally, I want to simply pose a question for you. And that question is, what do we want the equity markets in this country to look like in the future? We think the answer to that question encompasses most of the issues that need to be focused on coming out of last October. But let me start by turning back the clock to October 19, 1987, lovingly, lovingly referred to now as Black Monday. It was a day not unlike the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, where I would bet that everybody in this room knew exactly where you were and what you were doing for the entire day. I think the best story about the 19th that I've heard is a story that Alan Greenspan told on himself last January when he came to the exchange and spoke to our board of directors. Allen had recently been appointed chairman of the Fed, and on Monday, October 19th, he was flying from Washington, D.C. to Dallas, Texas, to address the American Bankers Association. When he left Washington, the market was down a mere 200 points. When he arrived in Dallas, the market had closed. He got into his car, began to drive to the hotel, and he said to the driver, he said, say, where did the market finish today? The driver said, 5.08 thought to himself, he said, my God, that was a hell of a recovery. <laughs> so, it wasn't until he got to the hotel that he realized, in fact, it hadn't gone back up, but it had had one of its biggest declines in history, in fact, its biggest. 
from our vantage point, October 19th, and as one who really sat in the eye of the hurricane that day, it was a day that I will not long forget, and that's for sure. The Dow, as I said, went down 508 points. Our volume soared to 604 million shares. Now, mind you, we were doing, on average, about 190 million shares a day when the 19th arrived. The equity value in this country went down $500 billion, or 25 percent in one day. The week of October 19th, the exchange traded 2.5 billion shares in total. To put that in perspective for you, that was more than we traded in the entire year of 1967. Somehow we weathered the storm. And as one who went through it, I'm not quite sure, looking back at it, how we actually got through that first day, but we did. And fortunately, it was a good day for us in many respects. There are many theories about what caused that day. I'm sure each of you have your own. I don't think there's any one thing that I can put my finger on, and I haven't seen anybody else who can, except for the fact that most investors coming out of a five-year bull market, seeing the Dow go from 900 in August of 1987 to 2,700 in August of 1987, from 82 to 87, the feeling was that we could just not sustain that level of 2,700. The economic fundamentals were not in place. The company's earnings were not in place, so there was a great deal of nervousness. Everybody we talked to in the summer of 1987 was nervous. If you add to that the fact that there was concern about higher interest rates, about deficits, about protectionism, and a number of other things, what you had was a large group of, of investors whose consensus sentiment, sentiment was that the market was ready for some kind of a major correction. To demonstrate the magnitude and the force of this storm on the stock exchange, let me give you a little background facts just to set it up for you. Before the 19th of October, we'd only had a handful of days at the exchange where we'd ever traded more than 200 million shares a day. And only one day in January of last year, we traded over 300 million. However, and as Charlie mentioned, strategic planning is one of the functions that I oversee at the exchange, we had in place on Monday, October 19th, a five-year strategic plan that called for the New York Stock Exchange to have peak capacity capability for 600 million shares. One small problem. We didn't expect it until 1990. So what happened was, on Monday morning, October 19th, we experienced a 300 percent increase in our business overnight, and the future arrived three years early. Now, I don't know how many of you could name a business that could handle a 300 percent increase overnight. Could an airline pick up and deliver three times as many passengers? Could a bank handle three times as many deposits and withdrawal? Could a department store handle three times as many customers? Again, overnight. Perhaps they could, perhaps not, but fortunately we at the Stock Exchange were able to do so. We got through the 19th and 20th because we were not afraid to look ahead. We were not afraid to begin to talk about 600 and 700 and 800 million shares when we were still doing 190 million. The problem was that that additional capacity, as all of you who are in businesses that have production capacity issues, doesn't come for free. The challenge was to get people to understand that you needed to invest in the future, and fortunately, we were able to do that. What about today? Today, we've, we've probably done about 200 million shares, maybe 215. If we had done 600 million shares today, it would have happened virtually without delays. By June of this year, we will be able to handle the same day we received last October 20th as if it was a normal trading day. And by the end of 1989, we will have peak capacity in place to handle 1 billion shares a day. Now again, the problem we face is averaging about now 175 million shares a day to convince people that we need to spend for the future. Because we cannot go back down to Congress and say, well, just because it happened once, we didn't think it was going to happen again for a while and all. Now that we've handled 600 million, albeit with some problems, we have to be able to do it again, and we've raised our bar and our sights to one billion in the future. What I've concentrated on thus far, and looking back on the 19th, is basically our electronic systems. There's another very important element to the exchange marketplace. That's the human element, better known as the specialist. 
The fact is that during the market break last October, the specialist system on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange performed better than any other equity dealer system across the country or around the world. It wasn't perfect, but as all the studies will show, it performed very, very well. The SEC said, and I quote from their study, although there were some instances of questionable individual performance, specialists as a whole met their market-making responsibilities, unquote. Our own evaluation of specialist performance did cause us to look at some problems that occurred where standards of the exchange were not met. As a result of that, to date, we have reallocated, in other words, we have taken away from one special, specialist unit and reassigned to another seven stocks. We have several other investigations underway, and if we find similar problems, we will reallocate those stocks as well. The other issue coming out of last October involving the specialist is the issue of specialist capital. Specifically, would the condition of the market during the week of October 19th have been better if it was the specialists who had more capital in the system? Simply stated, the answer to that question is no. As the Brady Task Force stated, and I quote, no realistic amount of capital could have stemmed the tide of the October market break, unquote. And there's a simple reason for that. The specialist on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange is not the buyer of last resort. No dealer in any market is the buyer of last resort. They are there to cushion the marketplace. Their primary function is to help make sure that whichever way the market is moving, up or down, it does so in an orderly fashion so that people have confidence in the pricing mechanism and can get in and get out on a continuous basis. No amount of capital, no amount of capital on the 19th would have allowed that to happen. However, having said that, we are already now taking steps to enhance the specialist system. As I mentioned, we're using the reallocation process to deal with performance issues. And secondly, we're enhancing their buying power by expanding their ability to borrow money and extending their lines of credit. So we're not resting on our laurels. We know we had some problems. We are doing everything we can to address those problems. We think the issue of capacity is a critical one. It is not easily solved, but we think we're making headway. One last point on capacity. It is not just enough for the New York Stock Exchange to be able to handle 600 million shares a day. When you call your broker in Portland, you have to be able to get through to that broker. That order has to be sent to the floor of the stock exchange. It has to be executed. A report has to be sent back, and that has to be done in a timely fashion. The whole system has to be able to handle 600 million shares. To do that and to help coordinate that, we've set up an operations advisory committee with our top 25 member firms so we all can coordinate how we're going to get this 600 million and 1 billion share day capability in place. Let me now turn to the second part of my talk, which is the issue of market volatility. To most investors, and I would suspect many of you in this room, volatility means program trading, and specifically the form of program trading known as index arbitrage. Now, before you think I'm going to bury you in a blizzard of buzzwords, let me see if I can debunk the myth of what index arbitrage is. Index arbitrage is nothing more than the ability to buy a group of stocks on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and at the same time sell a futures contract on that index in Chicago. Now what this means, however, is that you have fundamentally changed the way people buy and sell stock. In the past, people would go in and look at an individual company, the industry it was in, its, its earnings, its dividends, and they'd make a decision to buy or sell. Now a big institution will go in, and because they could not outperform the market, as represented by that index, when they were buying stocks selectively, they're now buying the market. What that sets up, though, is a new dynamic. They're watching the index itself and the future on that index, which are two numbers. And they're watching the relationship between those two numbers. As the spread is created and reach a certain level, the yield is greater than they can lock in on a T-bill, they will sell the most expensive and buy the cheap because they'll eventually come into parity. They don't care what General Motors sells at. They don't care what IBM sells for. They don't care what the quarterly report says. Now, if you're a CEO running a company, that creates a lot of problems for you. So it's a very, very difficult issue. 
and it is one that a lot of our constituents, our listed companies, our member firms, institutional investors, individual investors, all have a stake in. So we're trying to do what we can to deal with it. The biggest problem is that whether or not these different trading strategies do or do not create increased volatility, the perception certainly exists. Yesterday, you saw an example, and I'll talk to you in a minute, about even though we had a collar in place, you can still break through that collar. But forgetting that for the moment, yesterday the perception was that the market moved larger amounts of points than most individual investors are comfortable with. They didn't get into the stock market to watch it go up and down like a yo-yo. They're in it for the long term, and they want it to be moderately moving up and down. We introduced a rule in February, our board passed a rule, that said if on any given day the stock market, as measured by the Dow Jones, moves up or down 50 points from the day's close, we will restrict or withdraw any of this index arbitrage trading from our systems. Up until yesterday and one other prior day, that had basically kept the market moving up or down more than 50 points. The purpose of this was to try to control the risk coming into our market from the futures market because this trading only goes on when you have the simultaneous buying and selling, as I said before, in both markets. It doesn't go on unilaterally. So that's what we're trying to deal with. Now, does this mean that because yesterday we went to 101 and the other day on the upside we went to about 64 up, I think, that the collar doesn't work? The simple answer is it's, quite, it's too early to tell. We're studying yesterday, and we're studying the day that we went up 64 points. Now remember, the collar was not designed to stop prices from going up and down. It was designed initially to remove index arbitrage from our systems to free up the capacity of those systems for individual and institutional orders. It was also designed to try to modify marginal volatility in the marketplace. Now, even though we're looking at that, we're also proposing new alternatives. Yesterday, in fact, our chairman and CEO, John Phelan, testified before Congress and proposed a new idea. That idea is that should the market ever go up or down 300 points in one day, that all exchanges, stocks, options, and futures, would close temporarily, say for an hour, to give everybody a chance to catch their breath. Is this the perfect solution? Probably not. But we are looking at all these different alternatives because what we're trying to do is we have to remember one thing about markets. They're not static. They're living organisms and they need to be able to work and trade themselves in and out of situations and find their equilibrium price. If you stop and start them, you disrupt the mechanism. So we're trying to strike that balance between the two and it's not easy to do. The other issue coming out of this around uh, volatility is the issue of market liquidity. And this perhaps is an even bigger issue than the issue of index arbitrage. What the Brady report showed and what the SEC report showed that on October 19th, it was a handful, literally a handful, of major investors that triggered the events on that day. What had happened is they had believed that a product called Portfolio Insurance, which is probably the worst named product in the history of business, could guarantee that their portfolio would not go down in certain circumstances. When that did not happen, they basically stampeded the market and expected instantaneous liquidity in our market and in the futures market, and it wasn't there. It's like if everybody in this room wanted to get out that door at the same time, somebody isn't going to make it. So part of what we're trying to do now is to get these large institutions, and in fact the exchange has set up a new advisory committee called the Pension Plan, Pension Managers Advisory Committee, with members of these big institutions, to get them to understand what the market can and can't do right now. No market in this country is set up to handle huge waves of computer buying and selling. It's just the mechanism isn't there. So we have to get them to realize that while, yes, they have a fiduciary responsibility for their clients, they also have a much bigger public responsibility to the market as a whole. So we're in dialogue with them and their constituents, and we hope that that will prove fruitful as well. I think the other thing that we're trying to do is to also get back in touch with the individual investor. We realize coming out of last October that we need to talk specifically to him and her as well. And we've set up a separate committee to do just that. Interestingly enough, 
coming out of last October, what we heard was not a lot of panic. Nobody was selling wildly to get out. Most people sort of had a philosophical thing. Well, the market had gone up for five years. Yes, it was a rather dramatic correction, but we're in it for the long haul. In fact, the 108-point drop in the market in January of this year had a much more significant impact on individuals than October did last year. I don't know yet what the impact of yesterday was. But I keep coming back to the point that what, at some point in time, there will be a series of events like yesterday and January 8th that will trigger enough is enough among individual investors, and we're going to lose a very strong component of what this marketplace is. So it's something that we constantly pay attention to. Market volatility is, is a difficult issue because there are a lot of turf issues. There are a lot of different people whose economic stake is, is, is wrapped up in it. But we recognize that when you look at the fact that in this country there are 47 million Americans who directly own stock and another 140 million Americans who indirectly own stock in this country, that means there are nearly 200 million Americans who have one kind of a stake or another in this, in this marketplace. We have a responsibility to do what's best for that entire group of people. And that's where we're trying to stay focused on this thing. The next part of the, the volatility issue that I think I sort of really want to wind up with is to say that everybody says to me, what do you think is going to happen? When is it going to calm down? When are we going to return to normal again? I'm not sure that we'll ever see normal again. I'm not sure I know what normal is anymore. Um, I think basically what you're going to see is over the next period of weeks and months will be a series of experiments, whether it's the 300-point experiment that I mentioned before or other types of initiatives and experiments. I think people will be working together. I know we've opened up lines of communications with all of the exchanges, with the SEC, with the CFTC. The President, as you know, has put together this group of four involving the Fed, the Treasury, the CFTC, and the SEC for the purpose of trying to work out some compromises and get this thing work. Everybody has it in their own best interest to make this thing work, and I think it will. But I think that it's something that I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's a, there are any quick fixes or quick answers, because there really aren't. And that's the thing that I think it's difficult for all of us uh, to really pay attention to. Now, let me wind up with the last thing. The question I posed for you early, earlier, what is it that we want the equity markets in this country to be in the future. Traditionally, they've allowed companies, large or small, to raise capital efficiently to build new plants, to build new products, to hire new people, and to expand. This economy has created over 15 million jobs since, last, since 1980. Somewhere in that system, we must be doing something right. It is not designed, the equity markets are not designed for speculative behavior. They're designed to allow as many participants as possible to involve themselves so that everybody who wants to can and will participate. We need to keep that issue in very, very sharp focus. What basically happened, let me back up. To balance that, you have to balance the long-range capital raising against this short-term asset management that I mentioned to you before. What's happening with these institutions now Using these different trading strategies, they are buying and selling their portfolio in very short-term situations. You have to balance that against the long-term thing, and finally, you have to leave room for some speculation and dealer participation, because that's what makes markets work. So you have to have all three. The issue, however, really coming out of last October was it got out of balance. These large institutions and speculators came into the marketplace and basically threw that equation out of kilter. We have to find a way to readdress that balance, to make sure that everybody who has an interest and a stake in these markets is served well and fairly. If we can do that, I think we'll strengthen the competitiveness of our markets and the competitiveness of our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, now is the time for questions from City Club members for our speaker. Uh, there is a microphone available on the floor. Uh, also, there are forms for written questions on your tables. Those will be circulated and picked up by City Club staff members and other, others in the audience. Uh, 
as your board host today, I also have the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. Uh, what I'd really like to know is how the program committee was able to schedule Peter for today, just one day after yesterday's <laughs> minor correction, giving us all a little bit of heart failure. But in a more serious vein, uh, let me ask this. The Dow Jones average is observed uh, by everyone. The, the man on the street with maybe no stocks is still aware of it. Why are observers so preoccupied with the Dow Jones average? Aren't other indices somewhat more meaningful about the country's economic health? And how could the focus be shifted? I think the uh, simple answer, Dick, to that is, is that the Dow Jones has historically been that one barometer that people have looked at. And I think that uh, even though institutions, for example, their performance of institutional fund managers are measured against the S&P 500, the news media particularly has embraced the Dow Jones 500, or the Dow Jones 30 stocks, as really sort of the barometer. I think, you know, we at the New York Stock Exchange would love to have them use the New York Stock Exchange Index, obviously, parochially. We have 1,650 stocks. We think it's a much better uh, representative sample. But I think the Dow also, and I think one of the reasons, quite honestly, is, you know, the S&P 500 went down 11 points yesterday. Oh, who cares? <laughs> yes? This is more on Eve Shell, a member. First of all, welcome to a native son. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. It's uh, nice to be here. I'd like to change your focus a little from October 19th to October 20th. Right. The, I think the Pulitzer Prize was just awarded last week for a story about October 20th and what really happened during that time when it appears that the specialist system almost broke down, that we were very close to a market closure, and that perhaps, although I can't find any uh, substantiation. There may have been some kind of a concerted effort to participate in the Chicago board and cause some action on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, I'm, I'm no expert in, in stocks, but I'd be very interested in what the, what the party line is from the New York Stock Exchange, what your personal opinion is, and what the consequences of uh, that breakdown might be. It's a good question. There, there is, as one who actually sat through both the 19th and the 20th, there is no question that the 20th was a much more difficult day for us than the 19th. The issue in the 19th was how in God's name did the system stay together after you've exceeded theoretical capacity by 150 million shares. Somehow it did. Uh, when we woke up in the 20th, quite honestly, the capacity issue wasn't critical for us. We had done enough patching and filling overnight that we could be able to withstand most of what we thought would be, would be coming that day. The issue that the questioner raises is a very good one. That issue being, what happens if the market had gone down another 500 points on Tuesday the 20th? What you, in effect, would have had is you would have basically lost your dealer system, both in our market and probably the over-the-counter market, although there's some differences in that. But, and so it was a very tense time for us. I don't, there have been lots of speculation as to about whether somebody came into the, to the uh, markets in Chicago to begin to work on that MMI index. All the studies I've seen have not been able to uncover any facts behind that, but they do feel that there might be something uh, there. I don't, I don't know whether it was or it wasn't, but I will tell you this, that between 11.30 and about 1 o'clock on the 20th was probably the most trying time in those two days. And I think that you just, I mean, this is the thing I got back to before. We have got to be sure that these major institutions understand that, yes, while they have a fiduciary responsibility, they've got a bigger responsibility, which is if you run your marketplace out of business on Tuesday, what are you going to do on Wednesday? Yes. Peter, welcome back to Oregon. Thank if you. If you think a 100-point drop yesterday was bad, you obviously haven't paid your taxes yet today. <laughs> 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 I haven't, and it's a shocker. The 1986 tax law is anti-IRA. <coughs> we got a kitty tax. It doesn't pay to build funds up for your youngsters under 14 today, unless you can shelter it and get into something that's not taxable. The tax law is definitely anti-capital formation oriented in business. That's furthering the speculative concentration of funds and the institutionalization of the markets, which you allude to. My question is, why should an individual high-taxed investor invest in America today, and what's the New York Stock Exchange doing to encourage this? 
especially with our friends down in Congress. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I've got a simple answer for the first part of that question. I think people basically uh, invest in this country because they believe in it, and that may sound corny, uh, but I think there's an awful lot of the people that we've talked to in our Individual Investors Advisory Committee and other groups like this around the country, there's a tremendous amount of belief in this, in this marketplace, in this system. I mean, under normal circumstances, you would have thought everybody would have said, enough of this nonsense, let's fold my tent and go down the road and try something else. But for whatever reason, they have tremendous confidence in this thing. What we are doing to make sure that we don't erode that confidence, and, I, and it's certainly been shaken, and there has been some erosion. Uh, I mean, I guarantee you, if there's anybody out here in the brokerage business, they're telling you that the retail side of it is certainly not robust. Uh, Merrill Lynch reported a 33% decline in their retail business in the first quarter of this year. That's a lot of decline. What we're trying to do when we go down and talk to Congress and other people is to try to get them, as I said before, to get back to the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is the equity markets in this country were designed as public markets, not private markets. They're designed so that anybody in this room, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, anybody you want to, can participate. The Chicago markets are really not public markets, okay? Now, there may be some people in Chicago that want to debate that, and that's fine. But they don't certainly have nearly 200 million Americans with one kind of a stake or another in the Chicago markets. We need to keep going back, and in each one of the testimonies that John Phelan and other executives at the exchange give, down in hearings in Washington, we keep trying to stress that fundamental issue. It's a public market. It enjoys participation by nearly 200 million Americans, and we cannot lose sight of that. Yes? Um, could oh. I ask that each, each, speak, each questioner should identify themselves as a club member? Thank you. I'm Charles Sykes, a member. I, I certainly want to uh, uh, emphasize the fact that as a, a small-time uh, investor, I share the uh, concerns that you have exhibited about the volatility and the uh, implication that we could uh, very easily come to that uh, you're operating a, a big casino and that it's a managed situation and the individual has very little way to protect himself unless he sits with channel 18 in front of him two or three hours a day. There's one aspect of the situation that you haven't touched on, and perhaps you would do so. That is that there's an indication that many of the brokerage houses were trading for their own account and executing those orders before the orders of the uh, uh, customers were executed. And this further indicates to us that the uh, chance of protecting ourself, uh, ourselves in these crisis days is very limited. That's a good question. Uh, before I answer it, let me just see if I can, for anybody who may not understand the difference between what we call proprietary trading and customer trading. When you call up your broker at, say, a Merrill Lynch, Merrill Lynch has a series of customer accounts. They also have their own house account, and they trade and invest and buy and sell stocks for their own account as well. The question was, you know, it, was there any evidence that on the 19th and 20th, some of those firms were, if you will, front-running or putting their orders ahead of the customer? I haven't seen any specific evidence from any study that has, that has absolutely concluded that. We have gone in and we've looked at a number of firms, and we still continue to look at several firms where there have been significant claims that this was going on. At this point in time, no one has come up with any conclusive evidence. But the mere fact, this is again the type of a question that I think gets down to the root of this whole issue. If the perception is that there is a we-they market developing, they having computers, we don't have computers. They having more information than we do. They being able to get their orders in front of ours and those kinds of a thing. Even if it's not happening, if the perception is strong enough, it will create the feeling among a number of people that they don't want to participate. So part of what we're trying to do, we have now looked at, there's another issue coming out of this, which is the ability of certain firms to buy or sell stocks with the understanding of what's going on in the futures market. This is called intra-market front-running, inter-market front-running. All getting very complex, but the, f the, thing, the point I really want to leave with everybody here is that 
we are doing what we can to go in and regulate that. And one of the jobs of the, of the stock exchange, which most people don't realize, is we're one of the largest self-regulators in the industry. We are continually looking at our member firms to see that they do not abuse the rules and do not take advantage of their customers. But even as I said before, even if their actual performance is in fact not that way, if the perception is otherwise, that creates as many problems as not. A written question. Uh, given the electronic linking of world markets, what place and, and rate, is in, rate is now occupied by the New York Stock Exchange vis-a-vis -vis Tokyo, Tokyo at all? Thus far, there really has not been any direct linkage between any international markets, uh, namely London, New York, or Tokyo, the three major markets, if you will. There have been some experimental markets, uh, linkages between other markets. The international globalization issue is one that, again, uh, gets an awful lot of conversation. And several years ago, there was a great deal of talk about the fact we're going to go to 24-hour trading. I can tell you right now that there is no great hue and cry, believe me, for, 20, for the New York Stock Exchange to stay open 24 hours a day. We get into enough trouble in six and a half hours. Uh, so I think that what you're seeing internationally is a couple of things. One, Europe in 1992, the European Economic Community is coming together as one, one community, and they've got enough issues there to deal with between now and then that the linkage with exchanges is not, I don't think, the top of their list. Two, Tokyo is, operates and London operates quite differently than New York does. You have clearance and settlement differences. You have regulatory differences. What you do have, though, is an expanding number of what we call world-class securities, which will trade around the globe. But they don't necessarily trade in one market 24 hours in a given day. So what will happen is the Solomons and the Goldmans and the Merrills and the other will, if you will, pass those orders around the globe, but that they won't basically keep somebody up in New York or Tokyo or London 24 hours a day trading. Uh, I think eventually you will see global markets. I think it's just, it's like the consolidation in most industries. But there are a number of regulatory issues that have to be overcome before we'll get to that. Yes? Uh, Nan Kerner, uh, I'm a member of the City Club. I'm interested uh, about whether limits couldn't be placed on options and perhaps stocks. It's done in the futures market, and I understand in the Japanese markets. Right. Uh, we basically, we don't use price limits in the stock market. We use something called a trading halt or a delayed opening, which serves in a, in a similar capacity, but instead of absolutely shutting it down, it just call, cause, it calls for a temporary pause or a timeout. If a stock, for example, today had either a significant imbalance of orders, either a lot of buy orders without not very many sell orders or vice versa, or there was a significant news pending, a possible merger, acquisition, whatever. We would halt trading to let everybody, ha as many people as possible, have a chance to hear that information so that they could then decide whether or not they wanted to buy or sell that stock. Same thing at an opening, before the market's open if we have that same procedure. What we like about that is, is we don't absolutely shut it down. Interestingly enough, coming out of the 19th, some of you may have seen John Phelan in his press conference. And basically, as we began to prepare for that, we, just, we talked about a number of different things, and we finally got down to saying, wait a minute, there are really only two issues. One, we survived, and two, we'll be open for business tomorrow. And the big thing about price limits, and if you go back, and I'm not an expert in, in this, but if you go back to the silver crisis, you hit your limit at the opening each day and you drove it down limit to limit to limit to limit to limit to limit for two weeks and it caused panic and people sold overseas and people sold independently in non-regulated situations. So you're trying to find a way to put some kind of a governor on it but without shutting it down like that. Now, you know, it may, it may come to that but at the moment we think the trading halts work better. Yeah, I've got another one. I've got another question of my own. Uh, assuming the Wall Street establishment is opposed to the high levels of gov government deficit spending, why hasn't more pressure been brought on the current administration to reduce it? Uh, I can assure you that the Wall Street establishment is not thrilled with any deficits. Uh, 
We, uh, along with any other lobbying group that works down in, uh, in Congress, have tried everything we know how uh, to put together uh, representative groups of people to bring this issue to the attention of people in Washington. One of the things that the exchange can do and has done and will continue to do is we have very good convening power. Because we have so many different constituents from listed companies to member firms to individual institutional investors, the academic community, the media, et cetera, uh, we have in the past and will continue to put together conferences. And in fact, in, in the, the first week of July of this summer, we are putting together about 40 people to talk about how are we going to meet the long-range capital raising needs in this country. And part of what we're trying to get people to understand is deficits are one deterrent to being able to do things like that. I wish it was as simple as going down and having two or three conversations with people down there, but if any of you out here who have spent any time lobbying in Washington, it is a long and tedious process. Another written question. Uh, what factors provided the impetus to build the market back up on October 20th? Uh, this questioner has heard it was one small option trade that turned the tide that day. That was basically the same question that was, was asked back before. I think one of the interesting things that our research has shown, not only were there very few individual investors selling on the 19th, a number of the buy orders on the morning of the 20th were individuals. So there are a lot of people who have said in the past, the individual doesn't have a chance, he or she can't get in. The fact of the matter is, in many cases, and I've heard the argument made very compellingly, that the individual has much greater flexibility and much, much greater adaptability to be able to come in and make a decision to buy or sell in the marketplace in a large institution. Now, whether that was a good decision or a bad decision, I'm not the one to judge. But I think that what, what you saw on the 20th was that, in the first place, the majority of individual investors on the 19th probably didn't know what was going on until they got home. Why? Because they were all out earning a living. So they weren't sitting there with Channel 18 or whatever else they have watching this thing go down point by point by point. When they got home that night and they looked at IBM at 109, they said, my God, you know, two months ago this was selling at 175. It's still the same company. This must be a pretty good buy. So it's those kinds of, of issues that we, that, that we look at. But I think the individual, as long as no individual believes they can come in and time the market, and by time the market, know when to get in and when to get in. It was funny this morning. I was having breakfast in the hotel here, and there were a group of people sitting at the table next to me, and this one fellow came down the other. He says, well, he says, if you sorted out the little 101-point decline yesterday, he says, well, only as much as it impacted me. And he says, you know, just two days ago, I was telling my broker there were two stocks that we should have sold. I knew I should have gotten out of those stocks. Well, I mean, there'll be 100 conversations like that this morning and maybe 500 tomorrow. But I think that anybody who thinks that they can get in and out of this market and time it, I think, is just fooling themselves. If, however, you're looking at it over a longer period of time, Assuming we can get this volatility issue under control, and I wish I could sit here and tell you today that we've got a simple solution to that, but I can't, that I think, you're gonna, I think there is an opportunity for individuals to prosper quite nicely in the equities market. Another written question. Uh, Peter, you're involved in an education program that the exchange is conducting with high schools. Uh, what are you learning about our high school students' awareness of our financial institutions and structures? That's a very good question. Uh, in fact, before coming here uh, this afternoon, I had a chance to spend an hour up at Cleveland. And uh, I learned two new things today. Well, number one, some things are bound to change. When I grew up in Portland, Benson would never have thought about having a Rose Festival princess. <laughs> some things just aren't sacred anymore, I'll tell you. Uh, I spent an hour with a group of, uh, of students up there who were in one of their business academic courses. And I was, you know, th there was a uh, reporter there from Channel 2, and she asked me the question, are you surprised by the interest in this? And I said, no, I'm really not. I said, what, what we really find with, with kids, and this can be grade school kids as well as high school kids, everybody is interested in how you take an idea and turn it into something real. How do you bring an idea into, into the marketplace? They watch their parents maybe do it, or friends, or neighbors, or somebody down the street, or whatever. And so suddenly they're curious. And you add to that that over the last two or three or four years, particularly with the, with the growth in the stock market, the interest in business in general, the way the media has covered it, students, I think, now are much more interested in business. Business is in, if you will, to use the cliche now. 
may not be in forever, but it's in right now. And I think students, our educational program, which is one of the groups that's in my, one of the divisions in my group, has had about a quadrupling in requests for information and materials about the stock market in the last two years. Uh, we think that we're seeing a junior achievement, for example. I'm involved in the junior achievement uh, board in New York City. I mean, the, the increases in, in requests for, for junior achievement to come in and talk about how people start businesses and how people get jobs and how you raise capital and things like this has dramatically increased. So we're very excited about it. And I have to tell you, those, the, those, the kids at Cleveland today were great. I had a terrific morning with them. Okay. I've got one more. Uh, what can be done to diminish the market sensitivity to foreign marketing and investment decisions? Are, are we, in effect, becoming held hostage to foreign investment and foreign equity market fluctuations? I got that same question at Cleveland this morning, too. So, um, I, At this point in time, I don't think that there's any evidence, certainly. I think, uh, and, I, and I was trying to remember this morning what the figures are, I think foreign investment uh, and the New York Stock Exchange is less than 8%. So it's not one of these things, you know, the Japanese are coming, the Japanese are coming. The issue, I think, also is not as simple as are they investing in stocks or are they investing in real estate. Or they, what they're really doing is investing in dollar-denominated assets. Why? Because of the relationship between the yen and the dollar. Now, if that relationship changes, okay, you're going to see change in investment behavior. I was watching something last night on television. Everybody in Hawaii is up in arms because the Japanese are basically buying the islands, so they say. Some guy walked in and bought 137 houses. Seems a little bit much, but anyway. Um, I think what you're seeing, as I said before, is the Japanese who have a very, in many cases, have a long-term outlook, although they're getting shorter term from time to time, uh, are, are coming into this market looking at it. One other issue, which some of you out here may have read about, one of the questions that I've gotten a lot lately is why did the Japanese, in, this, in the case of Bridgestone Tire, pay a 38% premium to buy Firestone? They paid a 38% premium over the market price for Firestone. Well, the answer that basically I think that you can get down to, and I wasn't there, obviously, um, they have two choices if they want to build market share and consumer recognition in this country. They either have to build it, which takes a long time and a lot of money, or they have to buy it. And it was their feeling that that 38% premium was not as expensive as coming in and trying to build that over a long period of time. So they're very shrewd. They're very competitive. Uh, but I think that, it, if, at least from the equities market standpoint, I don't think that this is a situation where you're going to suddenly see them coming in and dominating the whole situation, certainly not in the near future. I think they used the money I spent on some Japanese tires last week. But, <laughs> uh, with that, uh, I'd like to extend our appreciation to Peter Moore for appearing today. Everyone with Thank you for your timely and informative remarks and your candid responses to our questions. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Big thank you. Yes. Are you Thank you, Larry. Thank you, sir. And uh, John is.